Well, last night here at Mundelein Seminary, I uh, gave my first rector's address, which is the opening of the year address. And I laid out what I said are the seven great qualities of a new evangelist, because I put the seminary here on that new footing, that we're here to produce the new evangelist that John Paul and Pope Benedict want. So I want to give now just a very quick version of that uh, talk. Here are the seven things I laid out. First of all, I said a new evangelist has got to be in love with Jesus Christ. See, evangelization is more than sharing ideas. If that's all it is, any theologian or anyone trained in the history of ideas could do it. Evangelization is sharing a relationship. It's offering people friendship with Jesus Christ. And as the Romans said, nemo dot quad non habit, no one gives what he doesn't have, right? So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you can't offer it. Therefore, the first step is that intimate friendship with the Lord, which is cultivated, I told the seminarians, by prayer, prayer, prayer. That's why prayer is so essential, especially the Eucharist. So there's the first quality. Second one I said, a new evangelist has got to be filled with ardor. John Paul II said the new evangelization is new in ardor, first of all. Fire. Aristotle said that people finally only listen to an excited speaker. That's in his great rhetoric. If you want to engage in persuasive speech, you've got to be on fire. So I told the seminarians, if you watch someone on TV advertising some goofy you know, weight loss project, and they have all kinds of ardor for it, we got to at least match that in our ardor for Jesus Christ. Furthermore, I told them that the key to it is the resurrection. The key to ardor is a keen sense of the resurrection. When you have that, you want to do what the first evangelist did, was grab the whole world by the lapels and tell them about it. So secondly, it's new ardor. Third quality of a new evangelist. They've got to know the story of Israel. Now, it might sound a little bit rarefied, but really it's not. Um, the first evangelist, think of Paul, Peter, John, the rest of them, declared Jesus as the fulfillment of Israel. The good news, the euangelion was, that Yahweh has finally come to rule, to reign. Another way to put that, divinity and humanity have come definitively together. See, the trouble is, in the story of Israel, God's creation is interrupted by sin. So God produces a rescue operation in the form of a people who are shaped according to his mind and heart. That's the story of Israel. But they never reached perfect um, union with God until Jesus Christ, where faithful Yahweh meets faithful Israel perfectly. With that, we find salvation. And that's what the first evangelist announced. Think of St. Paul saying that Christ is the yes to all of God's promises. Well, that means you have to know what the promises are. You got to know about temple, about covenant, about prophecy, about law, because Jesus fulfills all of that, completes all of that. So the new evangelist has got to know the story of Israel. Fourth thing, the new evangelist has to know the culture. Karl Barth, a long time ago, said the homilist should have the Bible in one hand and the um, newspaper in the other hand. Still good advice for any preacher, any evangelist. The Bible, yes, but then the newspaper, to know the culture. What's the culture we're facing now? John Paul said we got to be new in expression because we're facing a secularist culture. It says we can be utterly satisfied by the goods of the world. That negates the transcendent uh, referent. Um, that is complacent in its finitude. That's the culture that we're addressing. you got to know it inside now, I told the seminary. You have to know how our great tradition trumps it, answers it, defeats it. Our idea is that the glory of God as a human being fully alive, the burning bush, as God gets close to the world, he sets it on fire without consuming it. All of that. We have to know the culture. Fifthly, the new evangelist has to love the great tradition. We Catholics don't subscribe to Luther's sola uh, scriptura, adage. We don't say it's by Scripture alone. We say Scripture, yes, but the revelation of Scripture unfolds across space and time. The way a seed unfolds into a plant. The way a river deepens and broadens over time. And so we look at Chrysostom and Jerome and Origen and Augustine and Bernard and Thomas Aquinas and Anselm and Bonaventure and John of the Cross and Ignatius and John Henry Newman and Teresa of Avila and Therese of Lisieux and John Paul II. We look at this grand interpretive tradition of theology. 
And more to it, I told them, we look at the arts, great Catholic art, from um, Dante's Divine Comedy and the Canterbury Tales to the Sistine Chapel ceiling to Palestrina's uh, motets to uh, the sermons of uh, John Henry Newman, even to the stories of Flannery O'Connor and the films of Martin Scorsese, you see a Catholic sensibility that provides a prism through which Christ is more fully uh, seen. So the evangelist loves the great tradition, reverences it. Sixth, the new evangelist, I said, has to have a missionary heart. The fact that 75% of our fellow Catholics don't go to Mass on Sunday is a tragedy, and we shouldn't um, pussyfoot around that. The great um, liturgical reformers, go back to Reynold Hillenbrand and Virgil Michael and um, uh, Romano Guardini, go back to the Vatican II documents themselves, what they wanted was a revival of the liturgy. They wanted more people actively involved in the Mass. That three-quarters of Catholics stay away from the Mass. It's a tragedy. The number two religion in the country, if you counted it as a denomination, would be ex-Catholics. Many of the Protestant megachurches are filled to the gills with former Catholics. I would suggest, and I told the students last night, that's a tragedy. And if you don't feel that as a tragedy, you're not ready to be a new evangelist, because a new evangelist has a hunger and passion for souls, to save souls. Now, yes, in the ultimate sense of heaven and hell, but even in the proximate sense, to save a soul that's become divorced from God, that's a soul that is necessarily in anguish because we're all destined for union with God. And so the new evangelist has a passion for it, a passion for souls. Then lastly, I said, the seventh quality is a new evangelist knows and loves the new media, as I'm using the new media right now. Uh, I learned to type on a manual typewriter. That's how old I am. Um, Fulton Sheen, the greatest uh, media evangelist of the last century, would give his right arm for what we have now. That we can put something on YouTube and it's 24-7 all over the world. That now a Catholic blogger or a, someone um, using videos on YouTube has a far greater range than the leading Catholic um, journals, by which when I was a, a young man, you tried to reach the wider culture. Now, you know, my YouTube ministry has a far greater range than any of the, of the journals that reach out to the wider world. What I told the students was, I had to learn all this, you know, as I came of age, or learned it secondhand. I said, you've got it in your blood and in your fingers. You grew up with the new technology, so use it. Learn it. Uh, it um, um, get onto the cutting edge of where the new media has taken us. Um, lastly, I told them, this is your time. The church has gone through the worst crisis in its history in America anyway, the, the sex abuse scandal. Um, what's God doing during times of scandal? God is always in the business of raising up people who will um, bring the church back. Go back to that story of Eli and his, um, and his priest sons who were corrupt. Eli did nothing to stop them. The result was disaster for Israel. I said, that's our story. You know, Some priests were corrupt. Some of their uh, supervisors did nothing to stop them and we were delivered into the hands of our enemies. But what did God do during that ancient time as he raised up Hannah, who longed for a child? And when she had that child, she named him Samuel and gave him to the temple. And Samuel becomes the vehicle by which Israel is uh, brought to a whole new level of redemption. So I said, there are a lot of Hannahs, I think, around the last generation or so. And they've given rise to lots of Samuels. And I pointed to all the students and said, there you are, the sons that your mothers have given to the church that they might play a role in the um, revival of Catholicism. And that's the call of this time. A great call because it's hard. A privileged call because it's difficult. Um, that's, that's the call of our time. And I think it's a, it's a great time to be a seminarian. A great time to be a new evangelist.